Hey everybody and welcome to video number three for chapter 26 where we're going to be talking about African American. Now we use that term a lot, um, you know, kind of here in the United States, but it goes beyond uh, just the United States, you know, because Africans were brought as slaves to way more places throughout the Americas than just what would eventually become the United States. And, you know, we'll be talking about uh, kind of the different elements of culture, of lifestyle, and also just a little bit more about the hardships that they faced here in the Americas. So, um, you know, as slaves, they were brought to the Americas, uh, and, you know, we've used this term before, but syncretic, right? This blended culture emerges. It blended elements of the slaves' native African culture with the cultures that were imposed upon them by their new environment in the Americas. Now, much of this new culture revolved around their lives on the plantation. Right. The vast majority of Africans brought as slaves worked on plantations. And then these plantations generally harvested what we call cash crops, such as sugar. Right? You see slaves probably down in Brazil or somewhere in the Caribbean harvesting uh, sugar cane. Uh, some other ones such as tobacco, cotton, although cotton wouldn't become profitable until after the cotton gin was invented. These plantations, they might have some gardens for sustainable farming, uh, but their primary focus was on large scale cash crops. And these cash crops usually involved intensive labor by slaves, you know, backbreaking, sometimes even life-threatening labor. Generally, conditions on these plantations were rough, uh, but it was always worse in the Caribbean and South America. You know, you look at the map and you see how much more uh, slaves were transported to South America and the Caribbean than North America. And you got to analyze and say, why is that? Well, for a number of reasons. One had to do with disease. Disease didn't decimate the African population like the Native Americans, but warmer climates around the equator, like the Caribbean and South America, they still have higher rates of tropical diseases such as malaria and yellow fever. Africans are still susceptible to those. You know, they may have a little bit more uh, immunity built up than Native Americans, but they're not completely immune to them. Plus, conditions on Brazilian sugar plantations in particular were especially brutal. Uh, the life expectancy for slaves there was very, very low. Also, Spanish and Portuguese slavers, they imported a much higher number of male slaves and female slaves because of the necessity for manual labor. This led to lower birth rates. So you've got higher death rates, you've got lower birth rates. This all contributes to way more slaves being imported into the Caribbean and especially South America than in North America. North American slavers, they imported more women. Uh, not more women than men, just more women than what you'd see imported into the Caribbean and South America. And they encouraged slaves to have children in order to sustain slave populations. Plus, while the conditions in North America and plantations were not easy on slaves, they were a good bit better than in South America. They weren't literally worked to death. They were looked at as being more of an economic investment and not one that they could readily uh, resupply from Africa. Uh, regardless of where they lived, there was always a amount of resistance to slavery. Some were mild, like slaves purposely working slow or sabotaging equipment, uh, while others uh, you know, were a little more active, such as slaves running away and forming maroon societies. Uh, maroons were runaway slaves, and these slaves, uh, they usually ran away into the swamps and mountains, and sometimes they formed self-governing societies. Now, the most dramatic form of resistance was slave rebellions. Slave owners generally developed effective systems for keeping slaves under control, but the fear of rebellion led, to the, uh, led them to develop some pretty brutal systems. Um, the only rebellion that resulted in widespread change was on the French colony of St. Domingue, uh, where the slaves declared independence and renamed the colony the country of Haiti. And here you see some of the... Uh, Haitians themselves dressed in more in like the French tricolor uniforms, fighting against the French troops, and they benefit from having a standing leadership of this man, Toussaint Leovator, uh, kind of looked at in many ways as being the Haitian George Washington. But again, Haiti was the only area in the Americas that saw widespread successful slave rebellion. Now, let's get into African-American culture. As I said before, slaves were forced to change their cultures upon arriving in the Americas. Plus, the Africans themselves represented a wide array of languages. You know, you didn't, uh, West Africa didn't have only one language or one set of customs and cultures. So you'd have a lot of slaves packed into the slave ships throughout the Middle Passage that had difficulty communicating with themselves. And then when they got to the Americas, there were all sorts of obstacles in their path uh, for communication.
What this resulted in was new cultural traditions, uh, the most notable being the Creole languages. Creole is a generic term for mixed languages, uh, and these developed all throughout slave territories, mostly out of necessity. In order to communicate, the slaves had to combine elements of the different African dialects, plus they were forced to adopt the tongue of their European masters. Uh, examples of Creole languages are Gullah in South Carolina. Right? You see the Gullah versus the English uh, fortune. Now, you can see for some of them, uh, you know, kind of a, uh, there might be a phonetic similarity, Uman and woman, uh, whereas um, other, you know, might be completely different. You know, uh, Krakti talk, you know, now you don't see, you know, much of the English origin in that. So that obviously has more West African traditions to it. Um, but Gullah was a mix of African and English. And then you also have Haitian Creole was a mixture of African and French. So uh, there's not just one brand of Creole. It depended on the European language of the uh, their slave masters. Besides languages, slaves also adopted uh, religion. You know, so you saw slave Christianity. Uh, many slaves were forced or at the very least encouraged to adopt Christianity. Slave Christianity evolved to be quite different from traditional Christianity, though. It incorporated African cultural traditions such as drumming, dancing, sometimes even sacrificing animals. Uh, slave Christianity put a much higher emphasis on the supernatural also due to African traditions of spirit worship. Now, African culture can also be seen in music. You know, African music brought a sense of home for slaves working under very, very harsh conditions. You know, it was a way for them to survive working out in the fields on the plantations. They incorporated musical traditions with European language and Christianity. You know, examples might be instruments such as the banjos, right? You see here the two figures in the bottom right. You see one strumming the banjo, another one beating on the drum. Percussion, heavy rhythm, that was a very, very prominent part of African musical traditions. Uh, they also used what's called call and response music, especially out in the field where there would literally be an interaction. Uh, call and response, uh, they, you see a lot of that in African traditions, both in terms of their government, their social interactions. Uh, it's much more of an active, some would say democratic form of speaking and then in response, somebody speaking as well. You know, it could be very, very simple. So in music, you know, shave and a haircut and then someone else goes two bits. But it also manifests itself in the religion more with the very active participation that you see in traditionally black churches. You know, you you don't see the, you know, can I get an amen, amen type of thing in, uh, you know, your typical Roman Catholic churches. That evolved in black churches from traditions of African call and response that you find in African music and just African traditions in general. Um, so despite some efforts by slave owners to ban slave music, it persisted and the influence, uh, it can be seen in African music, African American music of the modern era. And lastly, African culture can also be found in food. You know, a distinct hybrid cuisine emerged in slave societies, such as gumbo. It's a dish combining African okra, which is an African word. So is gumbo with American vegetables, European vegetables, and shellfish, uh, rice cultivation as well in North America was brought by slaves. Now, slavery is not going to last forever. Calls for abolition of slavery go back to the beginning of the Atlantic slave trade, but it really picked up during the Enlightenment and after the American and French revolutions. You know, claims that all men are created equal gave fuel to the abolitionist cause. And this cause was not only taken up by whites. Africans, uh, while it was difficult for them due to their disenfranchised position and lack of voice, sometimes became very powerful advocates for ending slavery. An example is Alada Aquino. Now, Aquino was born a slave in what today is Nigeria, and he was captured at the age of 10, worked on plantations in the Caribbean and North America before eventually buying his freedom in 1766. Um, his autobiography became a bestseller, and he spoke passionately on the evils of slavery. Now, moral arguments like Equinos were all well and good, but what ultimately convinced people to end slavery was that it stopped being profitable. Slave labor did not come cheap. You know, large plantations had to use basically military style forces to prevent rebellions and slave labor required constant supervision to ensure it was productive. You know, on top of it, sugar prices fell in the 18th century while prices for new slaves increased. Europeans, especially the British and French, found by the early 19th century that industrialization was becoming way more profitable than slave agriculture. Now, this didn't immediately lead to the abolition of all slavery, but it did lead to the end of the slave trade. 
Okay, you look at the chart here. Denmark, even though, you know, doubt that they were very much involved at all, ended in 1803. The British, this was a very big one in 1807, U.S. in 1808, and then Spain, you can see, being the last one in 1845. Now, smuggling still, uh, you know, happened, particularly with the Spanish into, you know, British North America and areas of that. Um, but, you know, it was outlawed. So if they were caught, they could be prosecuted. Um, it did continue in areas where plantation agriculture could continue to turn a profit, such as the southern states in the U.S., but once the slave trade ended, it was pretty much inevitable that slavery would end as well, leading to the abolition of slavery. And you see here on the chart, you know, while, uh, when the major ones happened. The British colonies were the first ones. Here you've got the U.S. in 1865, obviously after the Civil War, and then Cuba and Brazil by the late 1800s. So while slavery died out in the Americas by the end of the 19th century, the impact of the Atlantic slave trade can still be seen through the African diaspora, right, the spreading out, the scattering of Africans, and the distinct African-American communities in the U.S., the Caribbean, and South America. Okay, so that wraps things up for Chapter 26, talking about the impact of the Atlantic slave trade. And then with Chapter 27, we're going to be going back to China.